drôle parce que je, je peux rien faire, je peux même pas lire une recette, je peux pas, je peux plus manger. Je... Bonjour, je suis Statis Kouvelakis et je suis heureux d'accueillir pour un deuxième entretien dans hors série Andreas Malm. Andreas Malm est professeur d'écologie humaine à l'université de Lund en Suède. Il est l'auteur de nombreux ouvrages sur les questions de l'écologie, du changement climatique et du capital fossile. Notre précédent entretien portait sur un ouvrage qui était paru et qui portait sur la dernière crise due à la pandémie du coronavirus. Mais aujourd'hui, nous nous centrerons sur un autre de ces ouvrages, récemment paru en français aux éditions La Fabrique, « Fascisme fossile, l'extrême droite, l'énergie, le climat », qui est en fait le livre d'un collectif qui s'appelle le collectif Zetkin, euh, dont Andreas Malm fait partie aux côtés de nombreux autres euh, chercheurs et militants. Et c'est précisément en l'interrogeant sur ce point euh, que je vais commencer euh, le débat. So, Andreas, uh, hi, very nice to have this, uh, uh, another conversation with you. Um, so, the first thing I want to ask you is, uh, what is exactly the Zetkin Collective? How did the idea of constituting such a group actually uh, came and what's exactly, what, what kind of group is it? Is it purely academic? It is, is it just turned towards political intervention? Tell us a bit more about this group of which we are a member among other people. Uh. Yeah, this started in the spring, late spring of 2018. And it started with me freaking out about the rise of the far right. And um, this was obviously when Donald Trump was still the president in the US. <laughs> Uh, but other far-right parties were then very much on the rise in Europe and uh, the climate issue featured more and more prominently in their propaganda. So I felt that there isn't enough attention to this articulation of uh, ecological politics and the rise of the far-right. And I uh, felt there is a research gap that needs to be addressed. So I asked some of my students to write about a page on their respective countries, so the countries they know about and speak mm -hmm. languages, in, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sum up what the far right has been saying and doing mm -hmm. about climate and energy in mm -hmm. recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, this produced much more material than expected. The original idea was to write one academic article, but we realized that there is so much going on that hasn't been uh, researched, hasn't been described and analyzed. And we constituted ourselves as a collective uh, and eventually settled on the name the Zetkin Collective. And we are 20 members and uh, we have produced this book where we've looked at what the far right has said and done about these things in 13 European countries plus the US and Brazil. Uh, <coughs> and it's been an intensely collective process and uh, it's made up of people who are either students or former students. Uh, some are uh, scholars have academic uh, jobs, or, although quite few. Um, I'm, I'm one of them and, and there are others as well. But the intention is to uh, bridge academia and activism. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite a few members are active in various uh, initiatives around anti-fascism or the climate movement. Uh, we organized a conference called Political Ecologists of the Far Right in uh, late 2019, uh, which was set up as an academic activist conference to mm -hmm. bring in people working on these issues, mm -hmm. uh, both in movements and in uh, academic research. Uh, now that the book is produced, there is a number of different projects within the collective to continue working on this, mm -hmm. uh, looking at other countries and uh, engaging in various attempts to get the anti-racist and climate movements in Europe in particular to uh, engage more with each other and things like that. Right. Can we say a couple of things about the, the name of the collective? So Zetkin, which of course refers to Clara Zetkin. So why, yeah. why, why did you choose uh, Clara Zetkin? I mean, she was a pioneer in the uh, Marxist studies of fascism. <clears throat> she wrote very early on texts about um, the danger of fascism right after the takeover in Italy. Uh, and she uh, paid serious attention to fascist ideas. Uh, there is this uh, liberal prejudice against Marxist theories of fascism that they, they don't deal with the ideational component of fascism. They only treat it as a, uh, 
uh, a class phenomenon rooted in the material interests of the capitalist class, which is a, a kind of scarecrow or kind of a, a distorted uh, uh, rendition of a rich tradition of Marxist engagement with fascist ideas and what they, what they represent and what's attractive about them. And she was very early uh, in, in doing this kind of work. She was obviously also a, a, a pioneering feminist who f started with the, the uh, International Women's Day and uh, uh, a, a committed revolutionary Marxist who fought fascism to the yeah. end of her life. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure you know more about her than I do. So. Well, I mean, what, what we need to say is that in, uh, in France, recently a collection of texts of mm. her and about her has been reissued by mm. the, uh, the publisher Hors d'Atteinte under the title uh, Je veux me battre partout où il y a de la vie. Uh, so the French, French readers now mm. have an opportunity to uh, have a direct access to texts mm. that have been unavailable since decades, actually, at least in, in France. Huh? She has been uh, forgotten and I think rediscovered probably because of the role she played in uh, socialist feminism. Yep. Uh, and and uh, now you, you provide another, uh, an access to another aspect in a way of her activities, which is indeed uh, anti-fascism. She also has a cool name. I mean, it sounds cool. Is that game? Okay. Um, so uh, I would like to, to start with um, with fascism, actually, as mm. such, uh, before moving to fossil fascism and what this means exactly for you. Uh, contrary to many people, including many people in, in the left and in the radical left, uh, you take the possibility of fascism in the current situation very seriously, as a very, uh, as a very serious possibility. Uh, so, uh, you disagree with people who say, you know, fascism is just a reality of the 1930s, uh, the context has changed dramatically, there are no more world wars uh, at, at, in, in our horizon. Uh, and, and, and I think the strongest argument, uh, which is related, of course, to this absence of, of general war, of world war or imperialist wars, uh, as something that is on the agenda, is the fact that most of those uh, far-right forces do not appear as typical fascist parties in the sense of using street violence mm. and street fighting, mm. but essentially as radicalized parties of the right, mm. many times with their leadership or their leaders not even coming from the right. Huh? I mean, Trump initially was a Democrat a supporter. Um, uh, uh, Orban in uh, uh, Hungary comes from the liberal opposition to the former uh, communist uh, regime. So uh, for many people, the, to calling them fascism is irrelevant. Hence, they prefer terms uh, that are somehow softer or appearing more uh, relevant, such as populism, for instance, probably the most uh, widespread, uh, or um, uh, post-fascism or, 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 or things like that. Uh, you take, uh, on the contrary, uh, not reducing fascism to these specific parties, but you consider that the dynamic between uh, these rising far-right forces in a whole number of countries uh, makes it relevant to call them uh, fascist or to make a connection between them and historical fascism. Why? You, but uh, I, I don't think that we say that any of these forces that you refer to are fascists. I mean, mm. we don't classify mm. Donald Trump mm. as a fascist mm. and mm. Uh, we don't apply that label to any particular far-right par mm. party that mm. we study. Mm. I, I wouldn't say that uh, Rassemblement National is by definition a fascist party or uh, yeah, the Sweden Democrats, the far out of my own country, or, or something like that. Uh, but what we argue is that there are tendencies in that direction, and mm -hmm. that you cannot exclude a scenario where something like fascism will appear. And uh, the um, consensus in fascist studies, so studies of fascism, until quite recently, was that fascism is a historical phenomenon, it belongs, it belongs to the interwar period, because there is no crisis on the horizon mm. that mm. can be compared with the depth and magnitude of the social crisis in the interwar period. Uh, the, I mean, this has been the position of uh, people from Dylan Riley, a Marxist uh, scholar of fascism, to uh, uh, Paxton and Griffin, the more liberal historians working on fascism, uh, saying that bourgeois democracies are stable because, and, and you know, there, there is no existential uh, crisis in bourgeois civilization coming, so therefore fascism is not on the agenda. Uh, 
Now, there have been some far-sighted scholars of fascism who have pointed out that there is, in fact, a very deep crisis uh, coming towards us, people like Jeff Eli, for instance, namely the climate crisis, which will probably be at least as, as deep and profound and uh, yeah, shattering to, to the stability of bourgeois civilization as the crisis uh, in the interwar period. And, uh, Eli has this notion of fascism-inducing crises, that fascism needs to be understood uh, if, if as a form of response to crises. And if we can see new crises appearing, then uh, they might be fascism-inducing fascism as well. So, I mean, uh, our conceptualization of fascism is future-oriented, if you, if you see what I mean. We don't argue that uh, there is fascism in any of the countries mm -hmm. where we have studied, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that it's it's a danger as we go deeper into the climate mm -hmm. crisis and the ecological crisis more mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. that these tendency might, tendencies might come more to the fore. Right, and uh, to j just recall what uh, Nikos Poulanzas, uh, a theorist that had. Uh, a strong influence on Jeff Ely, uh, yes. whom you mentioned. Uh, he was emphasizing that uh, fascism is the result and the outcome of a process of uh, leading towards yes. uh, fascism and not yes. something appearing as a kind of clear-cut rupture yes. with everything existing, yeah. uh, that, existing that's, before. That's a very important point and it's also a great difficulty in the study of this mm. phenomenon mm. to know mm. when you can mm. actually say that there is mm. fascism. Mm. I mean, mm. the, the, in, in the case of Germany, maybe mm. it's very clear that on the date when, when uh, uh, Hitler became a chancellor, there was fascism in Germany, but it's, it's not necessarily the case that you can pinpoint a, 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 yeah. a, a very specific date like yeah. that for, that, for the process. Well, what is very impressive is that in Germany, as well as in Italy, uh, the years before yeah. uh, the coming into yeah. power of, of yeah. Mussolini and Hitler yeah. were years where liberal democracy itself was drifting exactly. towards an increasing yeah. authoritarianism yeah. and opening the gates actually to yeah. fascism. And so what we see is actually a very complex process through which traditional bourgeois elites and, and fascists somehow come to a certain yeah. form of convergence yeah. to... Uh, and, and, and I mean, this is a process that you can, that you can refer to as fascization. Yeah, and I yeah. Think that, that's the term used by Pulanzas. Yes, yeah. and yeah. I think that is a term that is adequate to our moment in, to, mm. to a certain degree, at least, at least quite a few countries where you see these tendencies uh, unfolding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shouldn't we say here something about the role of neoliberalism in provoking this, uh, this crisis? I mean, is, isn't it quite clear that uh, uh, neoliberal policies have dissolved all the parties which have <laughs> applied them since decades, actually, and this is the case, obviously, of all the parties that have been in government mm. from the traditional right-wing parties, mm. which used to be somehow Volkspartei and mm. people's parties mm. in, in, uh, in, in many European countries more particularly, up to social democracy, of course, but also forces coming from the radical left, yeah, such yeah, as yeah. Syriza in Greece or, or you know, the, the Italian left, uh, which uh, comes uh, from uh, the old Communist Party. So all, all these forces uh, somehow uh, have seen uh, their, their influence and uh, uh, shrinking mm. uh, quite, quite rapidly, uh, mm. in some cases even collapsing mm. uh, in your own country, Swedish social democracy, which seemed all, all powerful for many decades, is now a party performing barely over 20%, I think, in, in, in elections, uh, something that would seem, you know, in, totally uh, incredible uh, mm -hmm. a few decades, a couple of decades ago. Um, so isn't it the case that neoliberal policies are, have also been leading to a form of crisis, uh, what Gramsci called an organic crisis, you know, the dissolution of uh, bonds of representation between mm -hmm. political forces and, and uh, social forces, actually, mm -hmm. that opens up a new field for mm -hmm. outsiders, mm -hmm. such as those far-right forces. I mean, would you agree with such yeah, an Yeah, yeah, yeah. Analysis? Of course, I agree with everything. What, what's interesting here, if you compare to the classical case and to traditional Marxist understandings of fascism, is that this dissolution, this organic crisis, and the total triumph of neoliberalism these tendencies have resulted in the historic weakness of the working class as a political force. Yeah. Whereas yeah. traditional conceptions of fascism was that it was a reaction against a strong labor, against the, the threat of working class revolution. Uh, but today the far right is rising because the left is so extremely weak. Yeah.
rather than being extremely strong yeah. as it was yeah. in the years after the yeah. First World War. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the weakness of the labor movement and uh, the internal fragmentation of the working class is, yeah. is actually the starting point of the first text of the Frankfurt School yeah. uh, in yeah. the early yeah. 30s in yeah. their analysis of fascism, actually, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Of, of, yeah. of Hochheimer more specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, let's come now to, um, in a way, fossil fascism, right? Mm. Uh, so that's the specificity of your uh, collective contribution to this uh, discussion. Uh, and you open up not one, but many entries through which this uh, connection uh, can be uh, established. Uh, so we'll, we, we'll try to discuss uh, the, the most uh, uh, prominent ones. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's start in a way with the most uh, obvious. Uh, most of the far-right uh, forces that have been on the rise uh, in the last period uh, clearly advocate uh, climate change uh, denialism. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very important part of their, of their discourse. We have seen that with Trump, we have seen that with Bolsonaro, who, who are in power, or were in power mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for a while, and, uh, but also for forces who are still oppositional forces, mm -hmm. such as the uh, Alternative for Germany party in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, so uh, you, in, in the book, you say that the climate change uh, denial is the position by default of, of, the, of, of the far right. So le let's try to and explore a bit this kind of, uh, you know, the, the reasons uh, behind this. Uh, there is one obvious reason, I mean, which is probably the easiest to uh, circumscribe and talk about. It's uh, the link between fossil capital as an economic force and uh, those uh, far-right movements and, uh, and leaders. Huh? Um, with Trump and Bolsonaro, it's particularly obvious. Uh, mining, fracking, uh, big uh, uh, capitalist farming, uh, all these things are, are very uh, central to uh, in, 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 the, in the forces uh, supporting those, uh, and, uh, th those, those, those movements. Um, how this, uh, I mean, should we see that as a reaction of uh, fractions of capital that feel under threat in the current uh, circumstance? Hasn't is, uh, was it always the case? I mean, how, how did we come to this uh, uh, connection mm. between um, uh, those sectors of capital and, mm. and, and this far right, actually? Mm. <laughs> yeah, ju just first on the on the term fossil fascism. So um, it, it was coined by Karen Daggett, but we picked it up, and a, 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 a very broad definition of it would be the aggressive defense of privileges called into question in the climate crisis, combined with systematic violence, systematic state violence mm -hmm. against people defined as the enemies of the white nations or various mm -hmm. non-white others. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and again. This isn't something uh, that has been fully realized, but there have been tendencies that point in that direction. And with the case of uh, Trump, I think you can see that part of his rise to power and part of the base that he built uh, was composed of uh, um, uh, deeply reactionary uh, groups in the fossil fuel industry that somewhat perversely felt themselves under threat by steps taken uh, during the second Obama period. Uh, with the uh, suspension of the Keystone XL pipeline, a very important one because it signaled to the industry that henceforth there might be a cessation of these kind of new uh, uh, pipeline projects and uh, similar uh, expansion of extraction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the industry, I mean, industry leaders were quite clear that we are going to throw our eggs into the basket of Donald Trump, who is a climate denialist, which is perfectly compatible with the interests of these, these companies, obviously. And they were the ones who started with systematic climate denial uh, back in the days of the 1990s. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 the fossil fuel industry made very good use of his period in power to massively... Uh, 
uh, expand the clout of the industry and open up territories mm -hmm. around the US mm -hmm. for increased extraction. And Biden is mm -hmm. approving some of that mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. So Trump did a very effective job for mm -hmm. the, that, mm -hmm. that industry in his, mm -hmm. during his four years in power. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, um, in Brazil, I think, again, a component of the base built by Bolsonaro was from the agribusiness sector that uh, was still itching to remove all the impediments to expansion in the Amazon that were erected by primarily the early Lula regime and that had then been uh, gradually dismantled first by, by Dilma and then by the coup regime but which Bolsonaro did away with completely and you know handing over the Amazon to, to these uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, these are the most clear-cut cases mm, mm, uh, of, uh, mm, of, a, of, a, of a deeply organic link between mm, mm, certain mm, fractions mm, of mm, capital mm, and mm, those forces. Mm, mm, mm. In other places, uh, such as Norway, for instance, which is the, mm. uh, the largest uh, oil and gas producer in Europe, mm -hmm. excluding Russia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the uh, relation between the far right and um, the oil and gas industry hasn't uh, worked in the same way in that you haven't seen any, because the political system works differently, obviously, you, you, mm. you don't see mm. these companies funding mm. the far-right party. Mm. Mm. Uh, but, but there has been a very close objective uh, relation between the industry and the far-right, mm. which has provided the ideological cover for a massive expansion of Norwegian oil and gas in opposition to any try, any attempts to limit that mm. industry with, mm. uh, with mm. Uh, reference to the climate situation. Mm. 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 And uh, uh, what this, this to us sort of prefigures a situation where as, as the climate crisis deepens, which we know it will be, it, it, it will, presumably there might be attempts to rein in the crisis and uh, rein in the fossil fuel industry. And the far right has already shown that it can play the role mm -hmm. of aggressive defender of, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of that industry. Mm -hmm. And that might very well uh, reappear in the near future. Right. So I think uh, what, is, what, what you show is that what is crucial here to understand fully this connection is not just the fact that it's a fraction of capital that is using instrumentally, let's say, no. a political force. The, the, there, are, there is something deeper that facilitates and in a way pushes towards such a direction. It's uh, nationalism. Yeah. It's the fact that uh, uh, fossil fuels can legitimately appear as being a national asset, mm. something uh, that uh, the nation uh, that is owned mm. by, by the nation, since it comes from its own soil, at least in countries that you know have a lot of uh, fossil fuel resources mm. of, of one kind or, or, or another, uh, and uh, also that it promotes, of course, an idea of uh, a national uh, sovereignty, mm -hmm. uh, strength, mm -hmm. uh, and even more, actually, domination and power. Mm -hmm. uh, you show very well that there is a whole uh, imagination that is built around uh, ideas of, of, of domination and power that are themselves uh, racially and gendered mm -hmm. um, uh, connotated. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, uh, so nationalism and, and, and uh, fossil uh, energy uh, f at the level of the ideology, uh, they perfectly feel to mm. fit together. Mm. Huh? Is that is that yeah, yeah, exactly is that the way yeah. you, to, you would point yeah. that? Yeah. And the the interesting thing here is that in a number of countries that have abundant supplies of solar and wind, the far right. Uh, resists using those supplies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, the far right sticks with an imaginary of fossil fuels as the national endowments while virtually never saying that oh our country is great because we have all of this wind or all of this sun with one recent exception that I don't think made it into the French book because it's in the postscript in the English edition about developments in 2020 Boris Johnson, who is an erstwhile climate denialist and uh, enemy of wind power, he used to be uh, mocking wind for being a useless source of energy. He came out late last year saying that uh, it's patriotic to support offshore wind, mm -hmm. not onshore, but offshore, mm -hmm. because that's how our country built its commercial greatness. 
and then he referred to Drake and other you know, heroes of the British Empire, mm. the mm. pre-fossile British Empire. Mm. Mm. All of these guys that he referred to were involved in one way or another with the slave trade. Uh, so he was harking back to, uh, to the uh, sailing ships that built the British Empire with offshore wind. And this was uh, a, a kind of innovation in uh, far-right uh, thinking about the, those things, where you had uh, uh, someone in a quite significant political position endorsing one source of renewable mm. energy mm. with mm. reference to what is mm. I, I, white mm. nationalism. Mm. That, you know, it's a, mm. it's a great heritage of mm. the white mm. British mm. Empire to mm. use mm. offshore mm. wind. Mm. So you, th this was a case that was interesting because it pointed to one direction. And you could, I mean, you could imagine that the Sweden Democrats would say something similar about the Vikings mm. or mm. Vox uh, starting mm. talk about mm. offshore wind because Columbus uh, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, had sailing ships and things like that. Very little of that has happened so far. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all of this kind mm -hmm. of rhetoric has mm -hmm. been based on fossil mm -hmm. fuels, but mm -hmm. we can foresee perhaps mm -hmm. a, a renewable mm -hmm. version of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we'll come back in a moment to this question of you know, nationalist possibilities of, um, of some kind of ecological yeah. Uh, yeah. politics. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like to, to ask you, you, you seem to suggest uh, uh, with, with uh, the Zetkin Collective at some point that um, this uh, fraction of capital, uh, so of, of uh, fossil capital, uh, can become hegemonic within uh, the capitalist class and that Trump was, but was that really so? I mean, I think that the... Uh, U.S. capitalist class was uh, very much divided and that probably the most significant or the most dynamic se sectors of it were anti-Trump, anti actually. I mean, we have seen, I mean, it's obvious in terms of the digital industry and so on, huh? mm -hmm. but even in the context of um, uh, the post-George Floyd uh, mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. uh, we have seen uh, uh, Wall Street companies, uh, bankers and, uh, you know, big tycoons of American capitalism uh, putting their knee, bending their knee uh, on the ground and, you know, making, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, advocating, yeah. you know, anti-racist yeah. uh, yeah, moral yeah. principles and, and, and things like that. So um, is it really uh, somehow uh, not to say about what the, uh, the U.S. state yeah, uh, yeah. did uh, with, you know, very significant sectors of it, including uh, mm. intelligence mm. Uh, turning very clearly mm. against uh, Trump or uh, the most respected voices of the U.S. establishment. Think about newspapers such as the New York Times mm. and so on, which mm. I think represent the capitalist class in a more organic and uh, way than, let's say, Wall Street Journal, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, which is, appears as a kind of very corporatist, um, mm. I think, paper owned by... Uh, uh, Murdoch and, and, and so on. Um, so do, do, you, do you see the possibility of this sector of capital becoming really somehow hegemonic and driving the, the whole accumulation process or on the contrary is it a kind of rear guard yeah, battle yeah, 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 for yeah. you know a, a sector of capital that is doomed to a form of decline one way or yeah. another which means that politically we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of the capitalist class to move you know from one sector to another mm. from one fraction to, from the hegemony of one fraction to another, mm -hmm. not to talk about finance here and, and so mm -hmm. on. So, uh, yeah, the <coughs> these are extremely pertinent questions. Uh, first, on <coughs> the situation during Trump, my reading is that much of the capitalist class was uh, very skeptical about Trump when he first appeared mm. and uh, would much rather have seen Hillary Clinton win and become the president. Uh, and the branch of the capitalist class in the U.S. that banked on Trump before he won was fairly narrow. But once he had won, and in the first three years of his period, there was uh, a, a, a change and a fairly ecumenical support for Trump, de facto support, from swathes of the capitalist class in the U.S. You know, The Economist ran uh, features one year into his presidency about how big business in the U.S. learned to love Trump because he served them with so many boons, uh, not only the fossil fuel industry, but the various tax cuts and uh, uh, even some of the trade policies were, mm -hmm. uh, were seen as uh, beneficial to, to segments of, of mm -hmm. capital in the U.S. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and, and ironically, even the wind power industry, uh, 
supported Trump and the Republicans during this period and uh, mm. uh, gave more funding to mm. Republicans than mm. to Democrats because mm. they were mm. also mm. sought by Trump. Mm. This changed in the final year of his presidency mm. with uh, be because the, I mean the capitalist economy in the US was doing great <laughs> relatively speaking mm. from uh, the perspective of the capitalist class mm -hmm. up to the outbreak of the pandemic. And who knows, I, mean, I suspect that without the pandemic, Trump might very well have won mm. if, if, the, if the economic trends would have mm. continued and his, his approval rates were fairly high up to the, to the pandemic. Mm. Then you had the pandemic, you had the economic crisis, and you had George Floyd and the mass uprising against racism in the US. And during this year, yes, parts of capital again swung back to uh, the democratic uh, loyalty that they had mm. uh, at the mm. moment of Trump's election. Mm. 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 Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, on the role of the fossil fuel industry, uh, we should be clear that it's not the case that the fossil fuel industry can defend its interests only under the rule of a far-right president, mm -hmm. uh, to look at the US, mm -hmm. that denies climate. Mm -hmm. Rather, one of the amazing things about the fossil fuel industry is, is its extreme proficiency in yeah. defending its interests under it's, whatever rule there yeah, is. And yeah. It developed under Obama. I mean, you make yeah, a very course, nice point that the yeah. fracking technology yeah. itself, yeah. I mean, yes. was very much favored yes. and facilitated yes. by the yes. Obama administration. Yes. I mean, so there is this, you know, the, the pendulum swings back and forth between what we call capitalist climate governance and uh, far-right anti-climate policy. And you see this in other countries, Poland and Norway as well, mm -hmm. that these two things go quite well together mm -hmm. uh, often. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the distinction between them is not very mm -hmm. clear always. Uh, <clears throat> but on the question of, of, of the hegemony of this fraction of the capitalist class, uh, as a provider of energy, it remains absolutely central to how U.S. capitalism works mm -hmm. and arguably has become more central to U.S. capitalism because of the boom in oil and gas that has turned the U.S. into the world's largest oil and gas producer again, something no one uh, would have thought imaginable a couple of decades ago when there was all this talk of peak oil and these things. <clears throat> um, and uh, that class fraction is deeply intertwined with financial capital. And we, you know, we still see all these reports coming out about how the major banks in the world are pouring mm -hmm. trillions mm -hmm. of dollars into this industry. Mm -hmm. So one, one really needs to study, and I'm not an expert here, mm -hmm. but there are others who study the, the very deep links between yeah. financial capital yeah. and, and uh, this, this yes. kind of fossil fuel industry. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the scenario that some people sometimes consider is where you, you would have a challenge from renewable energy capital that could rise as a hegemonic force. But there are very few signs of that happening. And a fundamental mm. reason for that, I think, is that renewable energies do not and seemingly cannot generate the same amount of profit that mm -hmm. fossil fuels can. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's extremely hard to see a branch of capital accumulation that can b become anywhere near as powerful as that coming mm -hmm. from fossil fuels, mm -hmm. challenging that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that fraction. That doesn't necessarily mean that th this fraction will be hegemonic in the sense of always representing mm -hmm. the common mm -hmm. interests of mm -hmm. the capitalist mm -hmm. class. But so far, it seems that there are few tendencies to weaken it as the energetic core of the capitalist class, if you see what I mean, at least in the US. Yes, and actually the development of renewable energies under the new liberal regime has taken the form of the state or public uh, actors subsidizing actually mm. private uh, companies uh, opening um, uh, solar uh, energy uh, uh, fields or um, uh, windmills or, 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 or things of that sort because they cannot be profitable as such. I mean, somehow the exactly. public system of uh, distribution of energy has to integrate them and to subsidize mm -hmm. them, so to subsidize, to, to make them profitable, uh, which is quite <coughs> perverse, of course. Uh, uh. Yeah, the, the, this, is, this is very, very interesting and central to what's going on because, you know, the technological advances in solar and wind are extraordinary and the result of them is is that the prices are plunging and plunging and plunging and plunging. And you can produce the, the cheapest electricity in all of history with solar power uh, in uh, many locations around the world now. Mm -hmm. And that should be a blessing. But it's not for the large 
energy companies mm. because the extreme cheapness of solar and wind means that the potential for profit is very mm. limited. Mm. 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 So there is a new uh, extremely important paper published by Brett Christophers, a geographer, who has looked at uh, what the BP and Exxon and Total uh, are actually planning to do. They say that they will expand their renewable portfolios but the internal rate of return on uh, renewable energy production for them is something like 4 to 5%. That's the, the kind of profit that they can generate on these projects. While on oil and gas, it's 15 to 20%. And that means that, of course, they will continue to invest mm. in oil and mm. gas because mm. that's where the profits mm. are. Mm. And the key here is that a transition away from fossil fuels is, is as long as it happens uh, in a capitalist context and is not led by the state, the transition will not be determined, uh, if a transition happens or not, by price, but by profit, mm. which is something different. Mm. Mm. So you can have ultra-cheap renewable energy in a capitalist society, which is the, 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 where we're heading at, heading mm. at. but mm. this being a, a, an obstacle to the transition mm. from a capitalist point of view, mm -hmm. because that means that you can't get as mm -hmm. much profit out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's go back for a moment to the question of ideology and the nation uh, that is behind that, that is so, so, uh, so central. Um, for all these far-right uh, forces, um, the politics of climate change are seen as a kind of instrument in the hands of forces fundamentally hostile to the nation as they see it. And uh, those forces refer either to some kind of globalist elites, you know, who are plotting against uh, uh, the, the nation and, and so on. And they are also seen as somehow being um, at the service of uh, hostile forces coming from the global south or associated to the global south. Uh, somehow uh, the politics against or the measures against climate change uh, work in favor of international migrations and uh, against uh, the existence of very uh, closed uh, borders that cannot be crossed and should not be uh, uh, crossed. Uh, and, and therefore they this kind of politics appear as a threat to uh, the white nation mm -hmm. as, they, as, as they conceive it. Uh, you give a whole, quite impressive, I have to say, range, range of, of, of examples of cases making this point, both historically and in the current situation. Can, can you say a bit more about this uh, uh, link between uh, the ideology of opposing uh, climate change and uh, white uh, nationalism mm. of the sort that is uh, promoted by those forces. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that this is a very complex and complicated phenomenon. And I don't think that we have anything like an exhaustive inquiry that, that gives all the answers and explanations to why we see this, this link between white nationalism and uh, fossil fuels and their technologies. But, I mean, I can just give a few examples. So, uh, the car is central to a lot of the, these discourses and people have long perceived the idea of climate politics that you should cut emissions as at least potentially an attack on the car. And the car is beloved by a lot of people uh, and the far right loves the car mo more than most. And in quite a few instances, you see the far right uh, defending the car as the vehicle for freedom that allows white people to get away from the non-white multitudes in cities. And the AFD, uh, I mean, the AFD is a great example because they're so uh, uh, explicit about their ideas very often. Mm -hmm. The AFD has had these campaigns in defense of the SUV, for instance, uh, the, the asylum movement in Germany has long had the slogan uh, uh, Keine Mensch ist illegal, no human is illegal. And they have flipped that into Kein SUV ist illegal, uh, uh, which is uh, a very clear signal that those people that you're talking about, mm. they have no value. What mm. really has value mm. is this mm. SUV mm. Uh, that we're going to defend. Mm. Uh, and the, the implicit message here is mm. also that the SUV mm. is what mm. allows us to get away from, uh, mm. from, from these mm. abhorrent mm. non-white Muslim people. 
in our cities. And uh, the Sweden Democrats have made it also very clear that uh, <clears throat> the reason they're gaining voter support, one reason is that you have a process in Sweden where uh, Swedes, ethnic Swedes, white people, depart the cities because of concerns around immigration, crime and all of these things and take their cars and move out to white mm, uh, towns mm, in the mm, countryside mm, mm, where there aren't mm, as many immigrants. Mm, mm, and for them to uh, have that life, they need uh, the car mm, and therefore they become hostile to, to taxes on gasoline or uh, you know, become more emotionally invested in the car and uh, resist any idea of climate mitigation. And the, you know, Sweden mm. Democrats have been uh, mm. explicit about this mm. being mm. one uh, mm. process behind mm. their increased mm. voter support. Mm. 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 Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just one, uh, one yes. Uh, yes. Ca Can we go back to the, to the uh, German car industry yeah. and comment a bit on this, uh, on, on, on this photo, actually, because you, you have also some pages in the book about, about this. Uh, so it's quite clear that this is an enduring legacy uh, yeah. of, the, of the Third yeah. Reich, actually. Yeah. Uh, you, you show very well that uh, during the Weimar period, yeah. Germany was lacking lagging very much behind yeah. in terms of its uh, yeah. car industry. And yeah. on the contrary, uh, Hitler tried to promote it, yeah. although of course it was only the beginning actually, yeah. the, the real, the fruits of that came later after yeah. the, uh, after the war. Yeah. Uh, the German car industry is very important in uh, German economic nationalism, yes. but also in the way I think Germans perceive themselves yeah. as being a very efficient nation. Right? Yeah. It's very much about what Germanness means. Mm -hmm. uh? There is here a kind of idea of mm -hmm. a certain idea, of course, of uh, uh, what 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 uh, you know German identity is about. Mm -hmm. That is, seems to be closely associated with the images of, of the car, mm -hmm. of, of of its technology, of the autobahn, yeah. uh, of the uh, exactly. of the technological efficiency mm -hmm. that is behind this, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, so th 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 there is something also ideologically that connects all this, right? Yeah. Yeah. And our hypothesis is that part of the rise of the ES AFD is a defense of mm. that mm. Germanness and that, mm. that subterranean, in some sense, tradition within mm. German society mm. 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 at the moment of its questioning. Yeah. And this was yeah. clearest in 2019 when the climate movement mobilized in, in Germany on a non-precedented scale and the AFD refined itself, redefined itself as a party uh, whose, whose most important focus was hostility to climate politics rather than migration, mm, mm. Uh, immigration. Uh, but, but the AFD is, uh, is a smart party in the sense that it adapts. I mean, nowadays, perhaps it, it has shifted focus again to questions surrounding the pandemic and um, is the anti-lockdown party in Germany. Uh, but, I mean, the climate crisis will inevitably come back mm, mm, mm. and question the German auto industry and mm. all the... Uh, mm effects and emotions mm. invested in it mm. and there will be a role for the AFD mm. again mm. to defend mm. it. Mm. Mm. Uh, now, le le let's say a little bit more on, on the racial dimension somehow of those processes. Uh, not, not, not everywhere, not in the same way, of course, everywhere, but why is uh, the politics in favor of climate change uh, perceived as something that is uh, manipulated or promoted by uh, uh, people seen by uh, the far right as being uh, the poor from the south, the non-white people, essentially, mm -hmm. and part of their attempt to uh, attack uh, the, the, the strength and, and, mm -hmm. and power of the dominant white Western nations. Why, why is that so? It's not, it's not obvious in the first, at, at the first instance, no, right, yeah, to see no. that there is yeah. a racial dimension as well. But nevertheless, you show that there is one quite convincingly, I think. Yeah, uh, one, one dimension is that the climate problem is structured in such a way that the responsibility for the crisis is historically concentrated to the global north, uh, to nations that in one way or another define themselves as white. Mm. I mean, it all, everything started in Britain mm. and uh, mm. Europe and the, and the US have been absolutely central to the process of creating the fossil economy mm. and have uh, still the bulk of the historical responsibility for the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. And this has been a, a constitutive element of the climate problem from the early 1990s with, with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility in the UNFCCC and all of these things. And on the other hand, the victims are primarily in the global south. And the far right 
quite early on uh, learned to <clears throat> turn this into a perception of they want to get us, they're coming to get us. And this whole idea about, uh, uh, about a climate crisis and climate justice is a way to, uh, uh, to punish us who are white in the global north. Uh, and to blame us for the world. I mean, Jean-Marie Le Pen made this very clear uh, at, an, uh, at an early stage that this was a conspiracy from non-white people and uh, things like that. Uh, and in the US, you even call about the fact that those treatises and this agenda of, uh, of climate change from international agreements for, since the Kyoto Protocol and, and so on is perceived as somehow a Negro thing uh, in, yeah, their own, yeah, yeah. In, in, in their own terminology, right? Yeah. It was facilitated by the fact that Obama was yes, for two yes, mandates yes, in yes, power. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, during the Obama period, the, it, 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 there seems to have been a very intense process of associating progressive climate politics with blackness and with the, the non-white threat to white supremacy in the US from the perspective of Republican voters. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's come to another dimension which you explore quite thoroughly in the book and which is most relevant for the French readership, actually. Mm -hmm. It's the position of uh, green nationalism. And mm -hmm. this is because the case of uh, the far right, at least in terms of a political party mm -hmm. in, in France, I have to say that if we consider the far right as a field, mm -hmm. as such, mm -hmm. climate denial mm -hmm. is uh, uh, pretty, you know, probably predominant um, mm -hmm. if we think about how the so-called fascist sphere mm -hmm. acts on the on the internet and so on but however as a party mm -hmm. and this of course matters because you know it's a it's a very influential in terms of uh, in electoral terms party uh, the rassemblement national uh, is not uh, mm -hmm. uh, a party of climate uh, denialism, uh, pr advocating climate uh, denial. Uh, on the contrary, it has integrated selectively some mm -hmm. ecological and, envir and uh, environmental things, but recuperating them in its own framework, which is all this is about defending borders, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, so there are several elements here uh, in the defending borders type of uh, uh, type of thing uh, against free trade, uh, mm -hmm. but also against the uh, you know, Malthusian uh, mm -hmm. arguments uh, and so on. Can you can can you develop uh, a bit about you know what this position of uh, green nationalism mm -hmm. uh, is is about? Uh, that you know uh, the, the the real ecology is an ecology defending mm -hmm. borders, borders mm -hmm. and and the nation, of course, mm -hmm. that needs to be mm -hmm. now protected mm -hmm. and. Uh, against its enemies and its threats uh, internally and externally. Mm. Yes, green nationalism is, uh, as precisely as you say, it's a current within the far right that says that the uh, environmental crisis in general and the climate crisis in particular are real and the solution is the white nation. <clears throat> Maybe they, they don't call it, they don't use the terms the white nation, but that's what they mean. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, there, uh, this draws on a legacy within the European far right that goes back, of course, to uh, the Nazi era and f further back in time as well, of a, a kind of romantic uh, nationalism with the idea that um, the ethnic people, the Volk, has a particular connection to its land. Uh, and I think this reappears in much of the rhetoric that you hear from Rassemblement National nowadays with the, the distinction between the nomads and the rooted, for instance, that you have the, the, you know, the French people are rooted in their soil and therefore take care of it. And then you have the nomads, the Muslims, the immigrants who don't have these roots. And the Jews, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 even yeah, if you don't name of them, of course. always yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the archetype of the nomad is the Jew, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. And when, uh, I mean, the, the, the NSDAP, uh, there were NSDAP people who used the exact same terms yeah. with the distinction between nomads and rooted and what they had in mind was obviously uh, only the Jews mm -hmm. they weren't concerned about Muslims back then uh, <clears throat> so there is yeah there is that uh, th that link in uh, European far-right thinking about those those things mm -hmm. there is also a major influence from Malthusianism including uh, in its more modern forms where there is a, a strand um, and quite important one of Malthusian thinking in American environmentalism, uh, 
and uh, uh, ecology, including even human ecology. Someone like Garrett Hardin was a professor of human ecology, one of the most influential thinkers about en the environment in, 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 uh, in modern history, who argued that the source of environmental problems is the overpopulation in particular in the global south. I mean, he had, I don't, I don't know, was it five children or something? So it, it's always, when, it, when you're a Methusian, it's always someone else who's overbreeding. It's the yeah, poor, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, workers, yeah, it's yeah. the, the, the yeah, non-white yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, these are some of the sources of green nationalism. Uh, uh, and yes, France is the country where this has become the strongest position, but you see it popping up in other mm, places mm, as mm, well, more and mm, more perhaps. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, we argue that this is not, uh, a classical form of climate denial, but it is a secondary form of climate denial mm -hmm. because it denies everything we know about what is causing the problem of global warming. So the idea that immigration, for instance, is a driver of uh, uh, fossil fuel combustion, global warming, is mm -hmm. completely unsubstantiated, to put it mildly. Mm, yes. Uh, ca ca can I, yeah? in a way, introduce here perhaps a kind of nuance or, yeah. or, or an objection? Uh, the Rassemblement National puts forward, in the case of France, of course, the necessity of defending uh, nuclear power. And you see, nuclear power is, uh, as you know, still the predominant uh, yeah. uh, resource for power in, in, in France. It's very much associated with a national idea. Yeah. Uh, it's something yeah. that, you know, France has developed uh, on its own yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, after, after the war. Uh, historically, it's connected to the left and more specifically to the Communist Party, yeah. uh, which played a very important role in developing this uh, technology in uh, post-war France. It still defends, by the way, nuclear, nu nuclear power. And in the 15 points of uh, an environmental referendum or a referendum about environmental issues, th that is the last proposal, the most yes. recent proposal yes. of the uh, Rassemblement National, uh, defending uh, nuclear power figures prominently mm. among these, mm. Uh, mm. Th th those points. And the issue of nuclear power is somehow not really addressed, I mean, in, mm. in, in the book. What would be your take uh, of, of, of this, you know, both on the position of the far right and, and the issue of nuclear power as such? Yeah. Let me, just, let me just complete my argument around uh, green nationalism as a secondary form of climate denial before I turn mm. to the nuclear I issue. Mm. Because it, it's important to get across our central point here, which is that green nationalism, insofar as it blames immigrants or overpopulation in the global south, so-called overpopulation, for environmental problems, is inherently a diversion. Mm. So the, it's dangerous for two reasons. First of all, it is one more uh, rod with which to beat non-white people. And this is the trend in our mm. societies, mm. not only in France, but very much in, in a country mm. like my own Sweden, yeah. where every conceivable social problem is attributed mm. to the mm. presence of non-white people. Yeah. Be yeah. it unemployment, crime, segregation in yeah. Sweden, poor results in schools. Yeah. You can blame yeah. everything on immigrants. Yeah. Scapegoating yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. It's at its purest. Yeah. And the, the attraction of green nationalism is that seemingly it allows you to blame environmental problems on immigrants as well. So what this means is that there will be one more reason for organized hostility against immigrants, one more uh, reason for discriminating and uh, exercising violence against them. It's, but it's also dangerous because as an environmental policy, it is <laughs> worse than useless. Mm. Because you will not close down any actual sources of CO2 emissions or other environmental problems by stopping immigration. Yeah. Now, on the question of nuclear, well, I think that uh, uh, this green nationalism, uh, specific to France, um, uh, has a particular idea of uh, nuclear power because it figures so largely in the energy mix in this country. Uh, 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 insofar as green nationalism takes off in other countries, nuclear wouldn't figure uh, as largely because France is quite special. Uh, now, uh, what I mean to say by that is, is that I don't understand the nuclear issue as essential to the project of green nationalism, broadly speaking, but it might mm. be so in France. Mm, yeah. mm, mm, mm. Uh, and obviously, I'm, <laughs> as I'm against all kinds of white nationalism, I'm against a nationalism that is attached to offshore wind, as with the case of Boris Johnson I just mentioned. I'm, uh, I would be just as much against uh, a nationalism that is attached to uh, nuclear power. Uh, 
and it's perhaps it, it's it's quite quite uh, more problematic and and repugnant than the uh, wind nationalism that that Johnson gestured at. But if you're asking about my personal opinion on nuclear power, I have an opinion about it that uh, some on the left would find controversial and mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. disreputable even. And my opinion mm -hmm. is that. Uh, the nu nuclear power is not the solution to the climate crisis, as some would like us to think. People like James Hansen or Mark Linus or other environmental uh, writers and scientists. But I don't think it's the problem either. Mm. And I don't think that the left and the environmental movement in this conjuncture in history should focus on trying to get rid of nuclear power. And I think that when Germany did so after the Fukushima accident, what it did was it allowed coal industry to flourish mm, mm. as a replacement of nuclear mm, mm. and that was a major disaster. Mm, mm, mm. Coal to me is infinitely worse than nuclear. Mm. Uh, I mean, I still haven't seen any serious evidence that anyone died in the Fukushima accident, but people die from global warming every day. Mm. Uh, um, so I, no, I mean, if... Chernobyl? If, in Chernobyl, yes, yes, yes. But still, how many died in Chernobyl compared to the victims that we have already from climate change? I mean, it's, we have, the WHO has said that we have 250,000 mm. every year dying from global warming mm. for quite some time. It's on a scale incomparable to Chernobyl and mm. to the totality of the victims from, from a nuclear accident. But the nuclear accidents are a real possibility, which is one reason I don't see nuclear as the solution. Another is that it's uh, very expensive to build, which is why almost no one wants to do it any longer. Another is that it takes a lot, very long time to build nuclear facilities, which is why solar and wind power mm. should be seen as the solution. They can be scaled up extremely rapidly, mm. they are infinitely cheaper than mm. nuclear, and they don't come with accidents. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But uh, if, if France were to decide today that we're going to get completely rid of nuclear, the risk is that you would f have a German situation that, you, mm. what are you going to replace this with? Uh, uh, I mean, obviously the ideal would be to replace it with renewable energy, but the first thing you should do is to replace every uh, element of fossil fuel consumption in the yeah. French economy with renewable. Okay, I yeah. understand, but le let me be a bit more brutal here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. is it just a question of priorities or uh, uh, nuclear power has a place in the energy mix of the future socialist society uh, you are dreaming of? Yeah, okay. Uh, I, uh, I don't have sufficient expertise and knowledge and insight into technological developments uh, mm. in the nuclear sector mm. to be able to say. Mm. Uh, I am not by definition against nuclear technology, uh, but there are obviously very serious problems with nuclear technology. And one that we haven't mentioned here is the, the imperialist dimension of getting the uranium from Niger or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The waste, of course. Yeah, yeah the waste, the of course. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, but, I mean, there, there are talks about uh, new generations of nuclear uh, power where you can recycle some of the waste and things like that. I don't know enough about this to say. Mm. I'd, I suspect that my position would be, no, it does not have a, a, a role in a socialist, perfect ecological socialist future, which will have to be based on wind and solar. But I mean, it, it, it's a som somewhat similar mm. to hydropower, which mm. is a, 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 a form of energy that uh, doesn't contribute uh, massively to global warming, and that it is sometimes seen as a renewable energy. Uh, but I don't think we should expand hydropower anymore. anymore. And few yes, because big dams, for instance, have exactly. uh, extremely yeah. devastating exactly. ecological consequences. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, for, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that is not to say that we, we should demand that the Aswan Dam be opened now or if tear down mm. dams mm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's enough of a challenge to get rid of fossil fuels. Mm. Uh, the, it, we don't want more dams, mm. but the dams mm. that exist, mm. let them be for mm. the time being and focus mm. on, on what's, what's mm. necessary right now. And then perhaps we can op open the Aswan Dam and, and others in, in due course. Yeah, l let me ask you another a bit of a provocative question, mm. but disconnected this time from nuclear energy because it's only one 
possible version of it, let's say. Mm. Uh, do you think that necessarily thinking in terms of national independence of a country, in terms of its uh, energy resources, is something reactionary that, yes, should, be, yes, yes. that should be rejected? Why not use it as an argument in favour of uh, developing, uh, you know, what, um, in a way, the natural resources, the, the, I mean, the, the renewable energies, I mean, I, I think, why not thinking of renewable energies as a possibility for uh, national, national independence? independence? Mm -hmm. uh, think of the term that progressive move movements in the global south very strongly fight for, for instance, sovereignty in terms of food production, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is uh, a very uh, powerful way to counteract uh, agribusiness, uh, or the fact that in some countries, since traditional agriculture has been destroyed, all food has to be imported. I mm. think of Venezuela, for instance, that relies exclusively on oil mm. and imports absolutely 100% of the food mm. that is consumed. Mm. This is something, I think, incompatible with mm. a kind of sustainable uh, way of life in uh, uh, an ecological perspective. And, and, you know, there are other ways, of course. I mean, we should also oppose, I think, uh, from, from a progressive uh, standpoint, free trade agreements, mm -hmm. among other things because they have sure. devastating uh, ecological consequences, sure. but mm -hmm. also because they facilitate the over-exploitation of the labor force mm -hmm. in, 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 in the global south. They put it in competition with uh, uh, the labor force in the countries of the north and with all the consequences that, that, that we know. So, you know, free trade is not part of our agenda. Mm -hmm. So if we are against free trade, it means that yeah. we want to put some, lim some limitations mm -hmm. on free trade. Trade. If it can be non-national limitations, but you know limitations put by a whole area, let's say you know progressive Latin American integration of the mm -hmm. kind that mm -hmm. Venezuela promoted yeah, at yeah, some yeah, yeah. at some moment, mm -hmm. uh, that, that that's of course a, a much better option. But if you are if you start a process of social change in in a country, uh, then you know you have to take some measures to defend yourself. So. Is it necessarily reactionary to think uh, about uh, independence, uh, uh, an independence based not on you know fossil fuel, etc., but uh, on an energy mix that uh, gives you know the most of of it to, re to renewable energies no, and so on? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think so. In much of the global south, in much of the global south, what you're what you're saying would make perfect sense. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there are, if you look at the African continent, there are plenty of countries with amazing uh, potentials for renewable energy. The problem, of course, is, is the, uh, uh, the monopolization of, of the technologies by companies based in the global mm -hmm. north or in China. Mm -hmm. And that you would need a, a redistribution, or a, trans, a te technology transfer, yeah. uh, or, or a production of domestic uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. of uh, wind turbines and mm -hmm. solar, solar panels mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but if we look at Europe, I think that if you imagine the entire European economy shifting to solar and wind, then the best way to do that is to have integrated continental grids where uh, <coughs> the supply of uh, solar in Spain can be matched to the supply of wind uh, in, the, in the North Sea or something like that. So if, if, it's, if it's cloudy in Spain, you can't rely on the sun as much uh, during that period. Of course, there is storage, but you know, there are these limitations to renewable energy. And then instead you can you can feed the grids with the wind that's blowing mm. at the same time in the North Sea or, or things like mm. that. Mm. So regional integration of energy systems mm. is preferable when you're moving to renewables mm. to uh, make sure that you can mm. deal with any kind of gaps. It's in in an extremely dense economy like Europe. Mm. It's much more difficult for uh, let's say Luxembourg or Switzerland or something like that to only rely on its own uh, renewable energy source. I mean, technologically, I, I, you know, there can be no disagreement. I mean, yeah. what, you, what you say makes perfect sense. But what? But politically, I mean, what happens if you know uh, um, the, the process of a you know quick transition yeah. uh, to renewable energies yeah. starts first in some countries, yeah, whereas yeah, yeah. on the contrary, other countries, you know, politically yeah. Yeah. are resisting that yeah. uh, very much, uh, yeah. uh, and, and 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 so on. What yeah. what what do you do? You need to go. Ahead. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. Uh, down, and down, in, down many, in, in many countries, it's possible, technically, and it becomes more and more feasible mm -hmm. with advance, mm -hmm. the advance mm -hmm. of technology, mm -hmm. to shift the entire uh, mm -hmm. economy of mm -hmm. a nation to mm -hmm. a renewable mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I certainly wouldn't oppose France mm -hmm. doing that or, or mm -hmm. Sweden doing that. Yeah, yeah. I just think that 
it, it works better if it can be expanded to, to you know, if these energy yeah, systems yeah. can include more control. Sure. Yeah. But I'm also thinking about the fact that, you know, in an eco-socialist society, an eco-socialist society, I think, in, involves a rather significant level of decentralization also of economic structures. I'm not here yeah. talking about, you know, a kind of pure horizontality and, and so on. Nevertheless, uh, as far as I know, experiments and thinking about uh, concrete economic alternatives involve, you know, in many cases, a level of uh, local circuits, local economies, you know, minimizing uh, transport costs and, and with all the ecological consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And this goes together with a level of uh, autonomy or self-sufficiency, not even at the national level, but at, some, but at a sub-national level as, as such. Uh, so um, I, I don't think that these ideas uh, they are, uh, it's not a panacea, of course, but I, I don't think there is something intrinsically uh, reactionary in thinking that, you know, as, as a, no, uh, in, no, no. That in political terms, you know, in a progressive direction, we can take control and go down a, a direction and showing, you know, before others uh, take the same road. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Uh, there, there's nothing intrinsically reactionary about having a local zone like ZAD or, or something else showing that you can have a, a local community and prefigure uh, a broader change, but I think that if we're going to have an ecological transition, which means, as, as a very central part of it, getting rid of fossil fuels mm. and moving to renewable, we need a lot of centralized planning for that to work. Sh certainly. Yeah. No, no, I totally agree. Uh, and, and I also, I mean, uh, I also don't think that we should look to an eco-socialist future as one where trade disappears. Uh, I mean, if you, look, if you look, for instance, at the Middle East and, and North Africa, you have economies that have been built, some economies, not all of them, not Egypt, not Morocco, but quite a few others, that have been built on oil and gas and their export. I mean, consider the Algerian economy. It's entirely based on that. So if, if Algeria or Iraq or Saudi Arabia are going to stop fossil fuel production completely, which they have to do, what are they going to do instead? Well, it's... It's somewhat difficult to see them becoming entirely self-sufficient in food. Uh, I mean, these are some f countries heavily dependent on selling certain goods on the world market to be able to import other, sure. other goods. Because they have populations that can't really be fed on their own territory yes. without, without import of some things. You're so I, I think that the idea that countries like Algeria or Iraq could export solar power it's not one that we should dismiss as being, you know, yeah, yeah. one more form of neo-colonial yeah, yeah. dependence. I, I agree. However, yeah. the destruction of the agriculture in those yeah. countries yeah. Is, is a major issue. And sure. as far as I know, all progressive views uh, uh, in those countries uh, include uh, a thinking about restarting uh, agriculture yeah. along non-agribusiness lines in those countries. Sure. Um, there is now um, uh, an issue that... Um, I want us to, to discuss, uh, which is a strategic issue, I think, about the uh, strategic problems of uh, an anti-fascist uh, uh, politics in, in terms of um, uh, the, uh, at, in, in this field of, of uh, ecology and, and climate movement. Uh, somehow you discuss, but quite briefly, at least in the French version, uh, the issue of um, the type of social basis of the far right and of uh, movements heading towards some kind of fascization and particularly as you call as you call the very sensitive issue of the working class support for it mm -hmm. and uh, as you said that the uh, towards the start of, of our discussion uh, this has to be seen as uh, the product of a process of defeat of mm -hmm. the workers uh, movement and so on um, there, there is however a bit more to say I think about this and this has to do with the fact that climate politics and ecological movements are themselves uh, torn and divided mm. by class struggle. I mean, there mm. is not one ecology and there is not only one climate change politics. 
uh, and for the for the same reasons, we, you don't have just one feminism, right? You have you have a bourgeois feminism, huh? of, mm. of which uh, Hillary Clinton, for instance, is a, a good representative, and you have the feminism of the 99% that our friends and comrades uh, uh, Nancy Fraser, uh, Chinsia Rusa, and Tithi Bataseria uh, are advocating, and which uh, is inspired by the many examples uh, in the global south. Think of uh, Latin America, women's movement in Chile, in Spain, and many other countries of course, uh, as, uh, as well, we, we, which are two, two, in a way, different things, although, of course, there is a level, mm. inevitably, of overlap uh, concerning a certain type of, of, of demands. Likewise, there is a certain type of ecology mm, that is sure. heavily dominated by upper middle classes and mm. shows total contempt, we have to mm. say that, mm. for the preoccupations and the concrete consequences of uh, the ecological transition sure. for the working class. Mm. Of, course, of course, this is not your case, because when you advocate <laughs> closing down uh, uh, oil companies, you say, we have to think about uh, con converting them mm. to uh, produce something that is useful and necessary for that very ecological transition, uh, cleaning, uh, air rehabilitation, and, and, and so on. Uh, same thing, of course, for you know, mining, and, uh, and, mm. and, and other, and other um, uh, alternatives uh, should always be proposed, I mean, to people losing their job uh, in terms of that. But I'm also thinking about, you know, broader issues which are usually associated with the lifestyle or cultural yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very fine to be in favor of cycling, but not everyone can afford cycling. Yeah. I mean, we know that concretely advocating cycling in, for instance, in French cities is something that looks very nice for uh, the upper middle classes still living in city centers, mm, mm. still living relatively close to their workplace, mm, mm. and who can use, you know, cycling mm. for uh, their daily mobility. Mm. But for working class people who sure. live in suburbia, who live, you know, in very difficult uh, conditions due to that, they need their car no because problem. no alternative actually mm, is proposed mm. to them. Mm. So, um, uh, what about, and, and I think that there is a resentment here mm. against mm. this kind of, you know, upper middle class class uh, uh, ecology on which the far right yeah, is tapping yeah, yeah, exactly. very heavily exactly. to turn uh, the working class and say, look, mm. the Greens are very clearly mm. a threat, not only, you know, mm. to you eating meat, etc. Mm. But by the way, it's also part of this mm. uh, uh, lifestyle type of agenda, but very concretely of, lo you know, losing your job, mm. not being able mm. to use your car to go to, to, go to work and, and, and things that make immediate sense and are, and are perceived as, as threats. So don't you think that we should supplement uh, the need of, you know, a kind of ecological rethinking of the agenda of the workers' movement, mm. Mm. also by a rethinking in social and class mm. terms mm. of the agenda of, mm, of climate and, and uh, ecological movements yeah. as well? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I totally agree with this. And the, the party that I think was most successful in formulating such a program in Europe was the UK Labour Party mm. under Corbyn, mm. Mm. which in its uh, election program uh, in 2019 mm. said all the right things mm. about climate and how climate politics aligns mm. with the struggle for uh, working class interests. Mm. Mm. And still they lost. Mm. But the, the Green New Deal is the most uh, productive uh, project that I know of to to try to combine these things. Mm, mm, mm. And that's one reason why I am personally more tend to be more sympathetic to Green New Deal than to degrowth, which mm, is, mm, you know, these are the kind mm, of two mm, mm. competing paradigms within mm, environment, the environmental left right now. Mm. And degrowth is uh, an idea that is, that is much more difficult, or the proponents of degrowth haven't come up to me with any, with any convincing models for how the idea of degrowth aligns with, with working class struggle and interests. Uh, to the contrary, you, 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 some of this kind of contempt for ordinary people can be on display in, in degrowth thinking. Mm -hmm. my, my dear friend and comrade Matt uh, Huber has a book uh, coming out with Verso called Climate Change as Class War, where he, I mean, I have some disagreements with him because mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we, we don't need to go into that. But he shows quite clearly how, how the degrowth movement, and he uses some examples from France, mm, 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 uh, is completely alienated from the struggle to put food on the table and pay the bills in, in, uh, yeah. in, in work, the working class people yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
but I'm, I'm, so and but you have you you you're making a, an important strategic point in that one way of uh, sapping the far right and the the purchase of its anti-climate politics for some working class voters is to uh, uh, avoid these these this targeting of ordinary people's consumption yeah. and uh, and frame the ecological project as uh, as a working class project so yeah. that, that's an important point yes. yeah i mean i mean th th there is a kernel of truth in the caricature of you know the upper middle class uh, uh, young people yeah. uh, cycling buying uh, organic yeah, uh, yeah, food yeah, course, yeah. Uh, living in city of centers course, and having course. only contempt for all those people who use their cars okay. eat a lot of meat yeah, okay. smoke and so on and so yeah, forth yeah, i mean and some, somehow, the, I mean, it, it is an issue and it, that it's, needs it, to, be, to be addressed, not only in terms of politics of the lifestyle. Uh, I'm very impressed by the fact that since uh, the Greens, for instance, in alliance with other left-wing forces, uh, took control of some cities in France, right? And mm, uh, mm. Uh, they have promoted a certain type of politics, let's say, at the local level mm. or, or, or at the city level. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on cycling, for instance. Mm. Up to a certain point, that's fine. I haven't seen the same passion for public transportation and I haven't seen the same passion for trains, mind you. <laughs> Whereas trains, yeah, of uh, everyone knows that it's an extremely ecological mode of transportation, oh, yeah. which in France, and that's, what, that, that's the positive side, if you like, of the contradiction, is essentially connected to the traditions of the labor movement, mm -hmm. uh, of the unions, and of the Communist Party, which mm -hmm. has promoted very consistently, not mm -hmm. always for ecological reasons, but also mm -hmm. for ecological reasons, train, mm -hmm. not only for individual mobility, but also to transport commodities, uh, uh, goods, and, and uh, things, th things don't, of, that don't you of, have that, in France? Of, that, of, of that sort. I haven't seen any particular passion, oh, yeah, yeah. whereas in France, the potential, I mean, it still has uh, it's under privatization and dismantling now, but it still has an excellent uh, railway uh, network mm -hmm. and, and, and an extraordinary potential actually mm -hmm. to fight cars and highways with, uh, with, with, with the way of, of, of the trains. It's quite uh, striking that uh, the green uh, forces and ecological movements mm -hmm. do not seem very mm -hmm. passionate about, ab mm -hmm. about this. And the cause for me is actually the class composition no, of no, these of movements. But don't you have a, 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 an equivalent of the Green New Deal uh, program in France? Because wherever there is such a program, public transportation is a key component. Yes, of, I yeah. think that only, you know, I think that in France, actually, uh, the most credible political force in terms of its proposals is actually France Insoumise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it promotes the idea of ecological planning, yeah, yeah, yeah. very strongly the idea of, of, of an ecological transition, mm -hmm. and connecting it with the reorganization of the way the yeah, economy yeah, works yeah, and yeah. taking, of course, into account yeah. the uh, social agenda yeah. and uh, issues yeah. of, that, of that type. Yeah. Much more so than uh, green, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the green Party, which yeah. I think is really a kind of example of uh, political of force dominated by this uh, upper middle class social media. Yeah, and, and, and it's the same with the Greens in Germany, but they are much more influential than the, the Greens here and might, yes. it might even become uh, kingmakers after the, after yes, the next but, Bundestag but, election. Right? Yes, but as, as a comrade said, it's, it's an article published on, in, in Jacobin that they are neoliberals yeah, with bicycles. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's essentially the same with the, our Greens. Mm. The, what, a political trend that we've seen in recent years and one that was radically accelerated by the Fridays for Future and the sort of climate moment in 2019 is the rise of the Greens as the kind of political mm, representative mm, in mm, Europe of mm, environmental concerns, mm, mm, uh, which is one reason that critique of Green mm, parties will mm, be central in mm, the coming years because mm. they are... Uh, insufficient in so many respects. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the Greens are embarrassing themselves in, in Germany by being in bed with the auto industry and defending the expansion of the Autobahn and, and things like that, precisely because they, are, they have no anti-capitalist edge. They cannot be the vehicle of the transition. So, therefore, it's a big illusion that the, this kind of uh, environmental awareness translates into voter support for the Greens. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that illusion needs to be punctured. And mm -hmm. the record of the Greens in government in Sweden and mm -hmm. Germany, uh, are, these records are often dismal mm -hmm. and that needs to be to be demonstrated. Mm -hmm. I, I'd just like to add that the, the kind of sort of petit bourgeois character of the environmental movement that you correctly pinpoint is damaging not only in terms of class but also in terms of race. Uh, 
because the sort of promotion of a particular lifestyle that you describe is, is the guarantee that the environmental movement remains predominantly white, you know, overrepresented by, by white people in Europe, which is in, in turn a guarantee that you won't see that convergence of anti-racist, anti-fascist and, and ecological struggles that we need. Uh, yes, uh, I, I totally uh, agree with you. The, the, the last, uh, in a way, strategic um, issue uh, I would like us to discuss is the issue of the possibility of an eco-fascism, actually. Mm. Uh, you say a few things uh, towards the end of the, of the book uh, about this possibility, and you point, for instance, to the alliance in Austria between the Green Party, which is very quite, quite big in, in electoral terms, uh, and uh, the Austrian right, uh, which is a quite radical, actually, and mm. reactionary and xenophobic form of, of, of right. And, and the terms of the alliance these two parties have, uh, uh, have reached uh, combine uh, green demands, mm. uh, ecological mm. demands, with clearly anti-migrant policies, mm. xenophobic uh, policies, and, and, and so on. So, of course, this is only, you know, uh, the, it can only be seen perhaps as an indication mm, of, yeah, of, of yeah, something yeah. going into that direction. But I'm here thinking of something deeper than this uh, that, is, uh, that has been historically quite important. I mean, you also say that the German Nazism has been a more complex issue in that terrain. Uh, the, the, there is this kind of reactionary romanticism mm, that has mm. for a very long time fueled uh, a certain way of thinking about uh, environment and ecological issues, which is about, you know, a fetishization of nature, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and uh, a rejection of technology. Mm. Uh, th there is a whole very long German, but not only, uh, mm. uh, tradition to, to this. It has to do with fetishization of the landscape, of the soil, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it can be combined to uh, themes of war, Mm -hmm. But not necessarily. Mm -hmm. the, you, you can also have, you know, pacifist versions of, uh, of, of it, or perhaps even New Age, if you like, mm -hmm. versions uh, of it. Heidegger is important as mm -hmm. a source of inspiration here. But I'm also thinking about uh, people like Hans Jonas, for instance, the German uh, philosopher, author of The Principle of Responsibility, uh, who towards the end of his life uh, said the following thing, and I think the, this line exists, perhaps not crystallized as in an organized force, but it exists, I think. And Jonas said the following, he said, uh, look, we are going towards some kind of apocalyptic situation here, uh, hence the principle of responsibility to avoid it. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had doubts about whether this was compatible with democratic principle. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, you know, the tyranny of majorities, as you know, there is a very strong in post-war Germany or post-war West Germany, uh, there was a very strong reluctance to majorities uh, because uh, it was seen that Hitler was uh, brought to power by mm -hmm. majorities uh, and so on. Uh, so majority Authorities are something that, you know, we should be rather afraid of and always try to channel one way or another. And uh, Jonas even advocating a benevolent tyranny mm. uh, as something necessary to establish, you know, the very radical and clear-cut measures that are necessary for an ecological transition. Mm. So a benevolent dictatorship saying, you know, we will close down in five years, all the mines uh, close down, all the sites of oil production, uh, transform the fuel industry into, why not, you know, green, renewable mm. uh, uh, energies of, of, of one sort of, 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 of another. Uh, do you see such a possibility as something that uh, can emerge uh, in the current, uh, in the wake of the current ecological crisis. Yeah. So we try in the book not to rule out scenarios and to point to very many different scenarios because there is no way that you can model these things and come up with predictions. And uh, I, I would not exclude a scenario like this. But uh, if I understand the, the scenario right here, it would be forces on the right ramming through a very abrupt transition and doing so with authoritarian means. No, not necessarily coming from the right. They no. might come from the left as well, yeah. but just the fact that they, they should dispense themselves with, with, you know, too much of democracy because yeah. majorities will never accept the cost entailed by radical yeah. measures yeah, yeah, yeah. going in the yeah. direction of the ecological transition. Yeah, but that, then if we're discussing this potentially coming from the left, then it's a discussion of the problem of uh, the risk of authoritarian degeneration. And then we're more on the terrain of uh, 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 Stalinism or, you know, uh, left forms of authoritarianism. But ecological fascism 
would come from the right. Mm -hmm. Or, and this is perhaps the, the scenario that seems to me most likely in the present, it would emerge out of a convergence of trends in the bourgeois center. Mm. And mm. Uh, my, f mm. my case for this would perhaps not be Austria so much as Denmark mm. right now, mm. where we are seeing a social democratic government forming a, a, a kind of cross-party Danish, a center of a cross-party Danish consensus, with the exception of the Unitalist, the, the left, the Red-Green Alliance, where all parties, are trying to bash immigrants as much as possible. And with nowadays, actually, even the Danish People's Party, the, the traditionally the strongest formation on the Danish far right, accepting the reality of climate change. Uh, and the social democratic government is mm. going completely nuts in its attacks on mm. immigrants. Mm. They are, as the only country in Europe, mm. deporting people from Syria who have lived in Denmark now for five or six years mm. back to what is supposedly mm. safe Syria. Mm. And they have this new law passed that says that if anyone comes to Denmark to apply mm. for asylum, mm. they will be transferred to a camp somewhere in Africa where that, that uh, application will be processed and so on. And this government is combining these kind of measures with certain progressive steps on the climate change. Tanzania, I think, that you Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the they, I don't think they know yet where, where they will have these camps. Uh, but here you see a prefiguration of an, of an ecological fascism, kind of, where you, where you can mm. see a combination of extremely uh, reactionary and aggressive measures towards non-white people, with what could be fairly enlightened moves on the climate front. Yeah. Uh, and if you extrapolate this trend, you are approaching something like ecological fascism. And it could even develop out of a political formation such as the Social Democrats, if they are as degenerated as they are in Denmark. It doesn't have to come from, from a, a, a crazy far-right eco-fascist sect, which, I mean... In terms of political power, these currents uh, that maintain the kind of eco-fascist legacy uh, in a militant fashion are still very marginal. I, I see it more likely that, that this trend will emerge from some kind of a, a convergence closer to the center. What is clear, however, is that the, the, the extreme center uh, is moving towards something much more authoritarian than yeah, what yeah, it yeah. used to be in yeah. the previous historical yeah. period. Yes. The, the Macron uh, yes, yes, uh, experience yes. in France is absolutely paradigmatic. Yes. Uh? Yes. Their level of ecological commitment is very limited because yes. they are too much connected with big companies yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, not only fossil fuel, yeah. but even agri the French agribusiness yeah. sector and, and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, however, there are some forces inside this bloc uh, yeah. which are clearly more favorable to some kind of ecological sure. uh, measures. Uh, and, and what is uh, uh, certain is that their authoritarianism uh, mm, has become mm. more and more uh, mm. clear mm. Uh, in, in, the, mm. in, in the years. Uh, isn't that a way to, uh, and uh, perhaps as a conclusion to our uh, uh, discussion, to say that uh, uh, a really consequent uh, ecological uh, thinking uh, has to be anti-capitalist yeah, and yeah, anti-fascist for that exactly. same reason. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Nikos Poulanzas famously said that uh, uh, socialism will be democratic or it won't exist yeah. at all. Yeah. And can't we say that you know yes. uh, ecology uh, will only exist if it is at the same time anti-capitalist, yes. anti-fascist, okay. anti-racist, of course. Yes. And uh, yeah. Exactly. That's the that's the point of our book to try to uh, make that argument. But uh, yeah. Many thanks, Andreas. Thank you, Stathis.